This is Control Structure, episode 115 for September 21st, 2016. This has been a fantastic time, and hope it's been a great time for all of you listening. I'm kind of winging this, if you can't tell. This show has notes. Uh, visit thenexus.tv slash cs115 to see them. Uh, I am a host, Andrew Bailey, and with me today is the other host, Stephen Orvis. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Steve. So, yeah, how how was the other Steve? The other Steve. Oh, uh, the other Steve was okay. <laughs> uh, it was last Sunday, and by last Sunday I mean like three days ago, that uh, my company had a little picnic, and I invited a few people over, and Steven was the only one that came. Uh, so, my friend Steve met my project manager Steve, which is kind of weird because like they're kind of two different people. So at work we kind of like to gang up on our project manager, I see. you know, like sort of like in a playful way. Uh-huh. So like try not to make, you know, try not to, you know, do, you know, try not to make it too hard on him because like he actually does interface with the, with the clients pretty well. You don't want him to get upset and just quit and leave you and make you interface with yeah. the clients. Yeah. Like I have actually said Thank you, Steve, for dealing with people like, you know, the other, like, specific names of uh-huh. the actual clients. So, uh, then he's like, thank you, Andrew. I appreciate that. <laughs> PMs can be very good to have when dealing with people and dates and deadlines and things, and uh, which is why they get stressed out. Yes. So, uh, you know, it's, it's fun sometimes to mess with them. But, uh, anywho, uh, let's see. I've actually been doing some work on my server, but more on that later. Um, like, we'll actually do an appreciate about that at some point. Um, so, uh, following up on last week's uh, thing uh, about uh, Uber uh, trying out their uh, was it uh, self-driving cars, uh, they're finally actually putting those into uh, like a trial run, I guess. Like, they're actually using them to pick up people. Um, so, like, this kind of wants me to, like, actually try them out, but I probably won't. It is, I'm guessing that you probably can't pick a self-driving car, or do you, do you think they give the option? They might give the option. At least I think I've heard that they do. That would be kind of fun if you could get the option and uh, just just for the so, last. But but there will actually be a person inside in front of the, the steering wheel just in case if something goes case. terribly wrong. Good, good to have that. Raspberry? 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 Raspberry! And you set up neighbors next door, so this is great. Yeah. Okay. So, apparently that rumor we mentioned uh, a few weeks ago uh, about Android perhaps coming to Raspberry Pi uh, is apparently a thing. And so you can now get uh, Android on Raspberry Pi. Um, But only for the uh, uh, Raspberry Pi 3. And maybe Model 2. Maybe 2, but I, it sounds like it's just a performance issue from what I was gathering there. But uh, it looks kind of snazzy. Let's say you can use the App Store and install apps and things like that. So this is Marshmallow, so that's pretty recent. Yes, not what my phone has on it. So, um, yeah, I think NuGat is like the very latest. Okay. But like it takes some time for Android to be ported and stuff. Since, like, it is an operating system, so you need things like drivers. Yeah, drivers are, are kind of useful. Yeah, at some point. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, interesting. The weird thing about it, though, is they, they're they currently charging, like, $9 for it, which is kind of struck me as odd, considering that uh, most things like that are open source. So I don't know how they're working that out, but... Uh, could be fun to play well, with. I mean, if, if they're using, like, the Google Play Store, there's probably some licensing fees with that. Okay, that would explain it if, if that's and, the case. And, like, if it's like, actually supported, then, like, you'd know that they're probably working on, like, the next version and making that compatible. 
Which would be good if, that, if that's the case, if they're uh, improving and making it better. So, uh, and, and if you don't like doing this, well, there's always the Raspbian, which works well. It's true. It is true. It's good to have options. It's an interesting step, I think, towards maybe someday making a build-your-own cell phone <laughs> a thing, which could be an ultimate hackable cell phone. Anyways... Uh, other things you can do with your Raspberry Pi than uh, make it into a cell phone is you can make it into a clock radio. Uh, this guy, Andy, I'm going to do bad in his last name, Philog, uh, he uh, had a old alarm clock that was going bad, and so they bought a new one, and apparently the screen was too... The, the LEDs were too bright for him and his wife, <laughs> so he decided to take this old uh, radio box he had and stick a Raspberry Pi in it and uh, hooked up the screen to it. It's kind of neat how he did it is he, uh, he basically used a web browser in Kisaki mode. Uh, Kisaki, Kis- 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 how do you pronounce that? Uh, kiosk. Kiosk. I knew there was a word for it, but I just couldn't think what the word was. Okay, anyways, kiosk mode. And so the display shows black and shows the time. And then he also plugged in the API with the Weather Underground to show the current temperature, uh, but it's actually just a web page local on the machine, and he's using jQuery and CSS Magic to format it. It's a it spa. Pretty. It is a spa. <laughs> yes, you are happy now, Andrew. There's spas <laughs> uh, in this project. But yeah, it yes. looks like a neat use and really simple to a, a clever way uh, to approach the problem to solve it. So I would have been thinking, well, how do you display it and such? But then he's just really simple and. Uh, not too much code. Although the curious thing is, like, how does the clock know what time it is? Like, how does he set it? Or, like, is there, like, some kind of NTP thing going on? I'm assuming the Raspbian probably has some sort of a, the NDP that updates it and sets it. Yeah. Kind of like how your uh, Ubuntu or whatever, when you boot into it, when the it Microsoft messed up the system clock on my motherboard, and so Ubuntu's like, oh, let me fix that for you. And then Microsoft's like, oh, it's wrong. Let me fix that for you. <laughs> Although I'm I'm pretty sure there's a setting when you install that says this is not a GMT clock. I know if someone had said that maybe the motherboard had a setting too, but I guess my solution has been just not to boot into Windows and then the problem goes away. So that's been working pretty good for me. Uh, and now for this week's LOL Warner Brothers. <laughs> so uh, Warner Brothers is kind of known for their DMCA takedown requests. They essentially have maybe an army of uh, bots going around that uh, you know gathers up URLs that look like they have copyrighted content on them that may or may not be owned by Warner Brothers and submit those URLs to Google to say, take these down. These are, you know, illegal materials. And they somehow uh, managed to DMCA take down some of their own pages and sites. That's uh, pretty funny to make a mistake like that. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, this is kind of serious because, like, when you do a takedown request, like, you are saying under threat of perjury that, like, you own these, like, these own, own these uh, uh, things and, like, they are, you know, uh, illegal copyright infringement stuff. Right. So, so like, even though, it's like, yeah, they do own their own properties, of <laughs> course, they've actually done this in the past uh, with, like, other studios' materials. That they didn't own. Yes. Yeah. And, like, even completely innocuous stuff. So something like some gaff like this of taking down their own things is not surprising. And as a follow-up, uh, this week's LOL ING. Do this one quietly, please. Don't yell. Okay, I'm not going to yell into my JBot array because I don't have one. Okay. Ooh. Don't... Don't don't yell at my laptop either. <laughs> it has a hard drive too, you know. Yes, it has feelings. It does have and feelings. Polygons. It seems like ING Bank's data center in Romania was severely damaged 
uh, due to a malfunctioning uh, fire extinguishing system that they were testing at the time. So uh, apparently, like there is uh, like higher pressure than what should have been in one part of the extinguishing system, and that made so much noise. Presumably, like it was trying to get out through like cracks in the pipes or something, that it made a sound so loud that it vibrated the hard drives and made them break, like totally destroyed like a lot of hard drives in this data center bringing it down for 10 hours on a Saturday, like, afternoon and evening. So, like, if you were out uh, to a restaurant on, uh, you know, Saturday night, and you try to pay with your credit card, uh, probably wouldn't work. So, um, yeah. How should I say this? I don't... You know, they, they did this as a drill. So, I mean, not everything was lost, hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully they had another backup that wasn't in that data center for in case of nuclear strikes, bombings, and yeah. other fires. And, like, Romania being, like, you know, like, suspiciously close to Russia, hopefully they, like, already had that in place. That's true. So, uh, they referenced in this article a video about, uh, this one guy who was in a data center and he had this monitoring software set up, uh, on the hard drives, it would show, uh, like, latency of the hard drives and such, and he yelled at some hard drives on this one rack, and he saw them taking more time to write, so it was apparently messing them up. Yeah. So, yes, loud sounds, uh, it's documented, and uh, so don't yell at your computer. It only makes it worse. <laughs> Unless you have a solid-state drive, mm-hmm. then you're totally fine. Unless you have a solid-state drive, yes. So, um... Uh, yeah, and noise in a data center is in, like, especially vibration is already a problem because if you've ever been in a data center, it is really loud. Like, you know, even in that video, you could barely hear the guy over all that noise. You could tell it was very loud. So, and, you know, even, like, not just, not just the noise, but if you have, like, what was that, like a 50 drive array there or something, it Mm -hmm. looked like? Like, if you have 50 spinning hard drives in, like, a solid unit, that's a lot of vibration, like, going through the steel and stuff. true. Each one would have its own vibrations and be uh, adding to it. Oh, look. The download is halfway done. Okay. It is halfway done. I thought thought that it had finished by now, but, uh, yes. Um, Steven is currently uh, writing to his hard drive, so... um, No yelling, please. (laughs) Or, like, very loud shouts or claps or anything? Uh, yes. Well, claps might be okay. Might be, as long as it's not, like, on the hard drive. Yeah. You're, so so long as you're not high-fiving it or anything. Yeah, that that's not so good for hard drives, apparently. So, you know who runs lots of data centers? Lots of data centers. Uh, that sounds like Amazon Cloud? Yes. Um, like, maybe, like, another cloud provider? Uh... Google has lots of data centers to store all of the many datas that they have. Yeah, like uh, Google searching. Google pretty much has a redundant copy of the entire internet. That sounds about right. <laughs> Just in case the internet dies one day, Google will be like, Hey guys, we have the internet saved here Don't already for shout. you. Oh, shh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, Microsoft also runs lots of data centers and prob- maybe GitHub. Unless they, like, kind of, like, outsource it maybe to Microsoft. Uh, Because apparently Microsoft is the number one uh, company uh, contributing stuff to GitHub. That is an interesting question. Where is GitHub hosted? So, uh, yeah, according to... uh, Let's see. What is it? Uh, Let's see. Apparently GitHub itself released a study that found that Microsoft has over 16,000 contributors to its projects, uh, which beats out Facebook by, like, 800 or so. And then Google is down there on, like, number... Five? Yep, yeah, five. Kind of surprising for Google. They've uh, slowed up. Because th- that used to be the company, like, it seemed like they were always making stuff. They had Google Labs going and all that. I think Google Labs is dead now. Google yeah. does, seems like they don't make the... The cool new stuff quite yeah, so much anymore. Yeah, they killed Labs a few years before Reader. Yeah, so. they 
have that habit of killing those uh, new products that apparently aren't or worth it. quirky products that appeal very much to a niche. At least they haven't killed Google Keep yet. Yeah. It's kind of an edge one that no one's ever heard of. Yeah, and, you know, they'll, they'll bring it out of beta a month before they kill it. Probably, <laughs> probably. So that means Gmail is overdue by a few years now? Well, if Inbox.com can close down their free email service, why not Google? Right? Yeah, and, like, I don't think their web search has been in beta at any point. So, like, that that's overdue by, like, two, 20 years or that so. It is overdue. <laughs> Anyways... Uh, any uh, ad hoc research there? Uh, apparently, GitHub, as of 2009 anyways, was hosted now at Rackspace. Uh, okay. That seemed to be the top hit when I Googled it, so that seems to be it. So not not by Microsoft unless Rackspace is owned by someone else. Um, but uh, eh, that, that seems to be seven years ago, so... Uh, Things might have changed. Who knows? It very well may have changed, given all the many spaces of data that they would need. So, um, I've been, uh, you know, you may have, uh, you know, noticed over a few episodes that I have been uh, installing uh, the latest Ubuntu on a lot of things. Uh, so, when I, uh, you know, redid my server and stuff, I was also looking to... Uh, uh, you know, do a VPN server. And like, while doing that, I needed to have a script, you know, to act as a service to control the, you know, like the actual VPN server uh, process. So uh, like, you know, stuff like, you know, uh, sudo init d, like whatever start mm -hmm. or stop or whatever. Um, so apparently the infrastructure that, you know, controls that is changing. Uh, so the latest Ubuntu uses something called System D. System D, okay. Yeah. Um, which works, like, it kind of does, like, the same stuff that the old init D does, uh, but expands on that quite a bit. So, uh, like, along with that, uh, it has, like, dependency uh, management stuff in it. So in order to, like, keep track of all these dependencies, your scripts need to have, like, some kind of header on it to express, like, what things should be started before this and to shut it down, like, this should be stopped before all these things. And, like, it also has, like, annotations in it to say, you know, start at these run levels and stop at these run levels. So, like, you don't really need to, uh, like pass into your little setup script or like your uh, update service thing that you run uh, like you can just read it right off the script it's, it's just a standard way to do that's pretty neat yeah, yeah. so uh, this I'm pretty sure that this is part of the Linux standard base so in theory you could take this and run it on pretty much any distribution that's good because I'm pretty sure that I net D folder structure was kind of a Debian thing, and I think Fedora kind of had its own thing they did. I forget what their structure looks like, but if it's becoming more standardized, it's going to help on configuration. And stuff okay, it's lot. okay to talk a little bit louder. Okay, we can talk louder. Just don't <laughs> want to stop the hard drives. That that's pretty important, you know. Yeah. Um. So uh, let's see where. We're... So I made a script for the uh, the VPN server. And the uh, system D was complaining that the script was not set up properly. So I'm like, okay, this is driving me nuts. It's com it's yelling at me and complaining every time I do anything with the script, uh, or even if I do an apt-get update, that it will yell at me saying, you know, it's like this script is not set up properly. Like while it's I don't know updating. Samba or something. That's kind of funny that it checks it then. Uh, so I looked, and Debian has this great article that explains it all. Um, so, like, for instance, if you're doing, like, any kind of networking stuff, you might want to have your file systems up and your networking daemon up. Before you mount your network drive, you might want to have your network up. Yeah. But that's the thing. Uh, at work, we have a Linux server, and... Uh, the 
previous version of some update we had had, it would mount the network drive no problem. That now this latest version that we updated it to, it uh, on a reboot from a cron tab, it doesn't bring the network up fast enough before it tries to mount it, and so it goes ahead and doesn't mount the backup drive. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, things switched around a little bit, yeah, it happens. So, um, Intel, about ten years ago, uh, was creating this very interesting and unusual graphics card architecture. They called it Larrabee. Uh, so, like, they were, you know, going through and they are you know, apparently, uh, you know, having some success with it, uh... But then management decided to not go after the gaming GPU market and decided to go to HPC, like the high-performance computing. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, like, these are essentially graphics cards in servers that do, like, I don't know, fluid simulation or something. Okay. Uh, So, today it's called Xeon Phi. And uh, one of the engineers that was developing this, like, did this rather insightful uh, blog post about how they were developing it. So what they essentially did was, like, you know those little Atom CPUs? Uh, the ones that make up the GPU? The... Like uh, netbooks and, like, oh, cell phones, okay. like, very low-end, yes. like, like, the very lowest-end CPUs that Intel makes? They essentially took one of those, kind of stripped it down a little bit, and, like, added some, uh, like, a lot of vector stuff to it. Then they put, I don't know, like, 50 of these on a single chip. So they put a computer on the graphics card Yeah, inside your computer. So so you have this chip that has, like, I don't know, 50 or 60 cores in it, and, like, that was supposed to, like, do, do your graphics work. And, you know... Uh, Apparently, like, it only had performance of, like, low-end NVIDIA GPUs. So, like, this wouldn't exactly be, like, the best, fastest GPU ever. Uh, But, like, they were, like, making some progress on it. But then management decided to, like, do, like, a different turn on this. So, and then this guy uh, says, uh, like, actually lists, like, five things that they wanted to do. And... It seems like they actually did most of them. Uh, I think only one they had, like, you know, like maybe mild success at doing. And then they, he mentions something about AVX, like the advanced, I think it's like advanced vector extensions or something, uh, like for 512 bit registers. Uh, So he's like, you know, if that's like the only thing that makes it into x86, uh, like normal CPUs. Then I think that's a pretty good thing. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure if that's actually implemented, but at least it's coming. So this allows CPUs to process even more things in a single instruction. So it, I found that it was a pretty good read. So looks interesting. So speaking about gaming, and as a warning, this may get us sued, but not because that we're doing anything illegal. It's just that these people are kind of lawsuit happy. I see. So, uh, Digital Homicide, purveyors of asset-flipped games that turn out to be not exactly that great, uh, ha- uh, has subpoenaed Steam for data on a few users, and they ended up suing them for a total of $18 million. Valve responded in kind and took Digital Homicide off Steam. So, uh... Like, if you've uh, been a fan or at least have been watching uh, Jim Sterling, uh, he doesn't exactly like these people. And, well, rather, he doesn't exactly like their games. But then uh, they sued him because, like, he's going on, like, defaming them and, like, saying bad things about their games. So now Jim actually hates these people because they don't understand that, you know, criticism is, like, a legit thing. Yes. <laughs> so, like, they're essentially a bunch of, like, 12-year-olds who doesn't who don't like criticism. That, that's what it is. They're acting like children that they can't take feedback. So, um, 
apparently uh, a lot of other people haven't liked them either. Uh, so uh, Digital Homicide has decided to go after them, uh, which seems bad. But then there are a few examples of uh, death threats in there, which might actually be illegal. So, like, if they're going after people who have, like, you know, threatened death and stuff, uh-huh. that's fine, but not against people who say, your game sucks. Yeah, that that should go without saying that they shouldn't be death-threatening people. So, uh, yeah. This is, uh, I guess, something to watch from afar. So... Like, if you, uh, like, watch some of the Jim Quisitions, like, he goes over this, like, several times, um, but they sued him back in, I think, January, so he hasn't really mentioned them a whole lot. Wow. I think Steam did the right thing. Take him off, take yeah. him off, uh, the store and be like, hey guys, sorry, but, uh, you're not worth the trouble. Yep. So if you ever come across a website or service that, you know, examines, like, some URL for something, uh, or you even yourself make such a service, make sure it does not accept file URIs, because you can, like, expose your hashed passwords and users and stuff, uh, because, like, if you don't watch out for people submitting file URIs, that they will that your program will interpret them as something on your local machine, which is probably not what you want. No, probably not. That's an interesting attack, though. So, uh, recently, uh, there was a service that essentially converted, uh, like, pretty much any web page to Markdown, and this guy discovered the vulnerability in this service, uh, which... uh, the vulnerability was fixed very fast, like surprisingly fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's not exactly the type you want to be sitting on your server. Yeah. So, I mean, with this, I mean, it's not exactly a remote code execution attack. It's more of a data leakage yeah. thing. And also keep in mind that encryption will not exactly help you in this case. It's true. One, I'm just thinking of three. One interesting solution the first place you could argue is uh apache or whatever your web server is i don't know if you could set your permissions up so it only has access to like the web directory so you could it shouldn't be a vulnerability in the first place but you could prevent an accidental vulnerability by having good permissions set up yeah and that's what i'm kind of doing on my server just in case yes so an extra layer of precautions yeah so uh net beans I don't think you've actually used this IDE. I have, actually. I really? I used NetBeans to code in Java uh, way back in college. That would be in and around the time when I was writing code for the Android app in college. Uh, I was playing around with NetBeans. I seemed, for whatever reason, to like it a bit better than Eclipse at the time. Uh, I think it, it, at the time it felt more polished to me, which is why I, I liked it better. I, I, it was an okay IDE. Yeah, and... Uh... I actually still like NetBeans better than Eclipse. Okay. Uh, mostly because I use Eclipse at work for boring things. Oh, so NetBeans is that I'm going to have fun at home with Java? Yeah. Okay, fair enough. So um, NetBeans might actually be an Apache project soon. So there is a proposal to uh, you know have NetBeans as an Apache project. Uh, I'm not exactly sure who exactly is like the organization i want to say that oracle is currently doing or driving netbeans development but uh i'm not exactly sure on that and if they are it kind of shows we use sql developer at work and there's features in it that don't work like the get feature was just broken for the longest time and then just one update it just kind of started working right now the current update we have you can't save after you edit an XML file, you can't save it to the database unless you run like an update statement. But it's free though, it's not bad for free, I guess.
Now for some appreciate and deprecate. So, uh, like I was saying, that uh, my uh, server and stuff was reformatted, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, for about a month, my blog was totally down. And I kind of knew that it was down, but like I hadn't gotten around to like setting up the database and mm -hmm. the web server and everything. So, last week, I finally got around to doing that. So, uh, like I told you about this on Sunday. So, I got the Glassfish server. I got it set up and everything. I got Postgres installed. I ran all the database scripts and all the tables are there and everything. So, I'm running the Glassfish and, you know, I'm trying to set up the database connection between the server and the database. And I'm trying to set this up, and suddenly the server says HTTP error 500. And I'm like, um, what are you doing? And, like, I keep on trying to do this, and this is, like, a more or less required step in setting up the database connection. But it's erroring out. And I'm like, this sucks. So I was thinking about maybe, like, stealing configuration from another uh, server somewhere, but I, you know, researched a little bit and came across a Stack Overflow question that says, you know, I can't set up the database connection in Glassfish. And they're like, um, yeah, Oracle doesn't care about anything that's not their database, so try this other server instead. And it was called Payara. And what it is, is a fork of Glassfish that is a drop-in replacement and someone actually cares for it. <laughs> so I swapped it all out and suddenly I can make my database connection. And then, uh, see, I think I tweaked a little bit and then I finally deployed my blog uh, program and uh, it wasn't exactly working. You know, like, because I even, I even had my HTTPS certificate from Let's Encrypt installed. And, uh, like, I'm pretty sure, like, even that was working. Uh -huh. But I still was not getting any data out in a browser. So, you know, that kind of stumped me for a little bit. And I looked around in the error logs and didn't see anything conclusive. And I'm like, okay, whatever. It's 11 o'clock. How about I just go to bed? You know, just, like do this tomorrow or whenever. And then, like, when I got up, I remembered, hey, like, there's a database table that you made that kind of dumps all of your, uh, like, all your exceptions into. Maybe there's something there. Turns out that I did not did not install the JDK, only the JRE. <laughs> so I'm like, I thought I installed that, but turns out I didn't, and then everything started working. <laughs> So uh, this Payara company, I was looking there at the site. It looks like they're getting their money from supporting the product. Yes. So like this is actually like a commercial, commercially supported thing. But uh, it's free, commercially supported. So yeah. like it's free, but if you actually want people to care for what you're doing. <laughs> uh, so let me look. So let's see. If... Uh, like, it was actually starting up. You would see, like, badass fish, <laughs> like, on the, uh, like, the splash loading okay. screen. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they wanted something that seemed a little bit stronger than, like, a rather docile, transparent fish. Mm -hmm. So they named it after, like, one of those vicious fish in the Amazon that's kind of like a piranha or yeah. a barracuda. Um, so, yeah. I uh, took that and uh, even optimized it a little bit since, like, pretty much everything that's applicable to Glassfish is also applicable to this. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I like this a lot better. So, nice. And, like, as you were saying, the commercial support, that's kind of important because Oracle does not do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty sure that I remember us doing a article about Oracle not doing commercial support for Glassfish anymore. Remember the thing with LibreOffice? Sorry, I'm stealing off your show notes there. That's fine. And, uh, yeah, that is seems to be a trend with them. So, uh, while we're on the topic, I want to deprecate Oracle. Like, everything Oracle, because Oracle. 
uh, you know, they kind of let my sequel, you know, go. They really didn't do anything with that, but the guy behind it was getting kind of anxious. So, like, he just left. Uh, they bought Sun and the uh, the main Java guy, James Gosling, he left after, like, two months. <laughs> wow. Uh, like, to this day, I am astounded by how fast they killed Open Office. They don't seem too excited about Java, nor do they seem all that concerned about making Virtual Box faster. So, uh, I'm pretty sure you have more grievances because you work with Oracle pretty much on a daily basis. Yeah, the database, this they have their own way of doing everything, and it's kind of weird. The main one was the, the SQL developer that I griped about uh, a few minutes ago, which kind of goes along the line of them not necessarily supporting other products. But yeah, yeah I think free. Yeah, I think I was using uh, SQL Develop uh, at one of my previous jobs, and I didn't find it all that interesting. It's... It's not it, terrible, it, but it's... It kind of did what it was supposed to do. Yeah, it kind of does what it's supposed to do. But not exactly the way you want it. Yeah, this definitely has some quirks <laughs> to it. you, you got to learn the quirks and learn the things that aren't useful. Like, I guess the biggest one I noticed was the... Intuitively, there's like a tree view of the database connections you have, and then under that you have your uh, trees for the, the views and the tables... You can search through there and find your table you want, or filter it even, and filter that view. Trouble is, that takes like a long time if you have like 200 tables in your database. Uh -huh. But if you right-click and hit Schema Browser, then it comes up with like the searches you type uh, for like the, your view or your packages, and it's like really nice. Like that should be the forefront UI, not the tree thing. Yeah, but like yes. have you not? learned anything from Google. I know. <laughs> Searches you type is really nice. And it was in Oracle for however many years when I was using it, but I just never realized it was there until one day I saw someone using it or I discovered it, and I was like, wow, why did they not make that more obvious? Okay, so, um, hey, you work in South Point, right? I do work in South Point. Uh, let's see. So I see, see the building you were looking for right down so, there so you work up here yes and for some reason i thought it was like over here but um it turns out that you work pretty close to the mylan headquarters and um there's a few things going on with mylan right now mostly because everyone kind of hates how their epi pens uh cost 700 dollars now and it turns out that you work, well, at one point I thought that you uh, had worked, like, right across the street from them, uh, but it turns out that you don't, which, you know, is fine. Still not a wa in walking distance. Yeah. So, um, let's see, I guess, I guess you wouldn't go out the south end, would you? Depends upon where I'm going. Like, if I'm coming to visit you, I actually will come out that end and go through that, that circle there that we're looking at. Yeah, so I do kind of go by that area. And then go down often. here. Uh, yeah. Actually, sometimes I'll go up this Morganza Road and then go down through this McMurray Nin Road. And then 19. Uh, so right someplace, right there. I take that road, and then I go up into those streets up in there, and then I go to that street, then I go to the street light right there. Then I go to 19. That cuts off all the traffic in McMurray. Huh. And the traffic's really bad there. And so yeah. you can kind of skip out on that traffic. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's see. I guess I guess since it's like not right across from where you work, you wouldn't have seen anyone like protesting. Uh, I didn't see that. I did stay in that hotel right there, though. Okay. So I stayed pretty close to them. So, uh, but no, I didn't notice protesters uh, in and around that area. So meanwhile, when I worked uh, at South Point, I worked at Crown Castle up here, which is like kind of like the northern point of south point and this building over here i think uh mylan rents out okay this nondescript building on google maps so and like you can well i guess i guess the subway doesn't want to show up here but yeah like i would walk past that building twice every day to get lunch and coming back from lunch so um yeah 
Uh, sure enough, like I looked, I even looked on Wikipedia, and it has Milan headquarters being in uh, Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, wait, that's probably South Point. I worked there. <laughs> wait, was that that building I walked past? <laughs> Which is totally nondescript, and you wouldn't think a company headquarters would be there, but there is not a company headquarters there. It's like another fancy building. Mm-hmm. That was probably paid for by those $700 EpiPens. Probably. What's funny is I remember hearing about those EpiPens before, and this is when they were like 120 or something, mm-hmm. and people were saying how expensive they were then. And that's before they did the price increase. Yeah. So it's... And, you know, I'm kind of conflicted about this because, like, they're a private company. They should charge whatever they want to. But at this point, there is no competition for that. See, that's kind of the problem. The no competition, now they can get really expensive. Yeah. And, like, this is, like, supposed to be used in an emergency situation. So you don't exactly know when this could save your life. Um, which, like, these things actually save people's lives. And if you can't afford that, that's a bad thing. Yes. Um, uh, let's see, where was I going with that? But, uh, yeah, they kind of need a alternative for this. And I'm pretty sure a lot of companies are, like, trying to, uh, like, develop something for this. It, it gets kind of into a gray area that's hard so, to find the, the right answer. So, like, Mylan, you know, comes to the rescue and offers some rebates. But it's kind of insulting about how they go about doing this because they, like, from what they uh, say about it, it seems like it's a catastrophe that's not in their control. <laughs> it's like, wait, you guys are responsible for this. You guys caused the price to go up. <laughs> yes. You can cause it to come back down. You're obviously offering rebates for it. So, yeah. It seems like most of the storm has blown over by now, but the problem still remains. In other words, people have given up. It seems like. So, ah. <sighs> And uh, that seems to be about it. Um, the next few weeks seem to be kind of calm. Uh, hopefully I will be able to go out and bike around quite a bit this weekend. It's not going to be hot or rainy. There you go. Because, uh, like, Saturday it was supposed to rain, like, all day, and it didn't rain a drop here. So I'm kind of mad at that. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Anything uh, you're looking forward to? Uh, I might maybe do some more blacksmithing here some evening. Uh, going to look at another property on Thursday evening, hopefully. And I hope to maybe pick up my car from the transmission shop, too, (laughs) at some point in time. And break the bank when that happens. Yep. Uh, let's see. Because I I remember back in, like, April that, you know, I did the, uh, you know, car inspection and stuff. And it turns out that my exhaust was pretty much shot. So Sears is like, uh, yeah, the best we can do is, like, order an entire new exhaust system, like, pre-welded and everything for $2,000. A lot of money. So I ended up going to, like, an exhaust specialty shop and getting it done for, like, 700 or, like, 800 or so. Um, but yeah. Uh, let's see. And I also look forward to finally, in several months, making a blog post. There you go. And mention the fact that nobody reads it because no one told me, Hey, uh, your blog is down. Are you ever going to do that again? Maybe they were going to contact you through the contact form, but the blog was down so they couldn't contact you. But the contact form is on the nexus.tv and if any of them would like to do so, they can do that on the Nexus.tv, even per- perhaps on the page where the show notes are, and click the little contact link so they can send us stuff. But maybe the people that read your blog don't listen to the podcast. Maybe I will have to put a link from the blog to the, uh, the podcast network, so um, it's something that apparently I haven't done before. There you go. So with that, have a good one. Have a good one.